Warning. 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 Now for a word of caution. The information you are about to hear is the exact knowledge they don't want you to know. Only on The Bridge Podcast. Hosted by Travis Haley. Rob Young. Dude, I'm exu- I am so excited to have you on this podcast right now, man. Thanks for coming down and, and joining us today. Thanks um, for having me. What I want to do is give you guys a, a, an introduction to Rob real quick, and I'll, I'll try not to butcher this, so correct me if I'm wrong here. But um, Rob has a very interesting perspective that I think he can share with us today uh, about the the active killing or hyper killers or shooters that we, you know, there's a bunch of different terms for. We can get into that later. But um, he has a very interesting perspective on on uh, on this subject. And uh, I want to talk to you because you are – a victim of the very first mass shooting in the United States. Um, now, a lot of people are going to say, oh, it was Columbine. No, it was not. Um, and again, we found out doing some research that mass shootings uh, were actually before that. The first one was like in the 70s, I think it was. Um, but the killers have happened since the 1700s. If you guys go online and look up freaking the history of active killing in the United States, you'll see it all the way back to the 1700s. So Rob was um, the, in the very first mass identified mass shooting which was mass actually shooting, called yeah. the stockton schoolyard massacre um this was 1989 you were six and a half years six old and, and um and i'll let you tell the story because i think it's extremely important but you were a victim you were shot and not only is he a victim and can can share that side of it to us he's also um you know committed your life to be a law enforcement officer and you are um, now a sergeant, uh, field training officer. You're an active, sh- um, active shooter response instructor for the Stockton, where the shooting happened, uh, Unified School District Police Department in Northern California. Um, so with that, I think it's awesome to have you here to see what you're doing now and where you came from as a kid and, and that experience and maybe be able to, to enlighten some people today. And, and again, we know we don't have all the answers, right? We right. don't. Uh, you've been doing this all your life, and, you, and you'll still admit that I don't have all the answers. Uh, but I think we can maybe shed some light on some subjects here uh, today. I want to do um, some questions we asked this week for, for our viewers to say, hey, what kind of questions would you want to ask a person like Rob? And I think we had some some great comments come in. And uh, But, Rob, I'm going to turn it over to you, man. Tell me uh, – Tell me what's going on. So, again, I, I just want to say thank you for having me. Um, you know, I want to put out this disclaimer, and I, and I always do. You know, this is, this is Rob Young talking, who happens to be a, a, a sergeant, you know, for a particular agency, you know, and um, this isn't necessarily the stance of my department. You know, we're going to talk about some, some pretty, you know, touchy subjects today, right? So I just want to make that very clear. That, you know, this is me talking. So, you know, my story really begins – January 17th, 1989 in Stockton. I was in first grade at the time. I went to a, uh, a small little elementary school. Uh, it was about a thousand students um, right there in central Stockton. And at the time, you know, like, again, this was 1989. We had a lot of immigrant families from Southeast Asia. Um, I think it's important to point this out and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the kids that went to my school, you know, were from Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, um, and they, they escaped what they call the killing fields and Khmer Rouge and yeah, I remember everything that. else. Right. So, um, for you history buffs and the people that don't know, look it up, you know, it, it's an important piece of history. Um, and it, it plays right into this story. So that morning, you know, it was a, it was a cold, foggy morning. And, uh, I remember walking to school that morning with my mom. We had about a, a six, seven block walk from our house. And my mom was working at one of the uh, local uh, hospitals, St. Joseph's Hospital, which is just a, a couple miles from the school. And, you know, we were we were a pretty poor family. We, we only had one car. My dad had the car, so we walked. And uh, I remember getting to school that morning, and, and my mom stopped me at the gate. And she said, man, I just don't have a good feeling about today. You know, and, you know, Mother's she, intuition. Mother's intuition, <laughs> And she she's never been able to shake that. She's always stuck to to that. You know, like I just I just felt like something was going to happen that day. Mm. She didn't know what was going on. You know, she just had this this gut feeling. And uh, you know, I remember telling her like it's it's okay, mom. You know, I, I was I was excited to go to school that day and and, and hang out with my friends. And you know, I, I loved going to school at the time. And we had a big kickball game planned for recess that morning. So I remember hugging my mom and. 
I uh, you know, went through the went past the fence line that that morning. And at the time, you know, we had this back gate that I that I walked through, and it didn't have like a swinging gate, didn't have a locking gate. Um, it was just like a like a pole and a pole, you know, just open. But it had a cyclone that. fence. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I went in, went to class, and later that morning, it was about close to eleven o'clock. It was recess time, time for kickball. Kickball, right? So we get out on the on the blacktop and. Our uh, our school had like the main building was kind of like an L shape and and then it was the blacktop and then there was some, a row of portable classrooms near that gate that I walked through and then there was like a soccer field behind us and the, the kickball diamond was um, it was on the blacktop pretty close to those portables and the portables right next to the right next to those were the walkway that led to that gate and it, it's important so we're playing kickball and all of a sudden chaos erupted and what had happened was there was a, a deranged gunman suspect we don't need to say his name parked his station wagon along that back fence line used a molotov cocktail lit his car on fire and they think that was um, kind of a ploy to, to maybe draw you know some of the kids towards the the fence line i don't think he was very successful in, in doing that but he was able to you know get onto our campus and he was armed with an AK-47 and a 9 millimeter pistol. And what he did was he crept up in between those portable classrooms along that same walkway that I, that I walked on that morning. And he had a clear view of our playground, you know, with several hundred students out there playing. Hmm. It's, it's crazy to think, like, it's been 33 years and I still learn things that happened that morning. And I bring that up because a couple of days ago, I was able to tell my story at a, at a conference and there were some police officers, retired cops that, that responded and there was some discussion. And, I, and what I learned, and I didn't know this, was as the gunman walked up, he walked past one of those portable classrooms and the teacher happened to look out the window and saw him walking up with this AK and she shut the light off and she told her students who were all deaf mm. to hide under the desks. And so that that's all they can do. It's, it's what do you do? You know, and they did. Well, he walked up to the, the, the door of that classroom and had a, a big glass window and he peered into the, the classroom, turned around, and walked away. Didn't say anything. Didn't say anything. Didn't open the door. Didn't try to open the door. He just, I don't know, maybe you didn't see him, you know. And so that's when he, he, he walked down to the blacktop, took a kneeling stance and opened fire. So again, chaos. I remember looking up and seeing everybody screaming and running and um, it wasn't registering to me really what was going on. Cause at that, at that time I, I had no experience with firearms. I never really heard a gun other than what I heard on TV, but I knew there was something bad happening and everybody was running in all different directions. And instead of running towards my, my classroom, that was, you know, the door of the classroom faced the, the opposite end, the opposite end of the, the blacktop. I ran towards a, there was a, a wooden handball wall, and it was about midway between my my classroom and where I was from the blacktop. And uh, so I made my way towards that handball wall, and again, you know, gunfire's going on, and and uh, I turned to to see where my friend, well, my best friend at the time, Scotty Barton, I turned to see where he was, and as I turned around. I had a, a round hit my right foot. It took my feet up of my head. I hit the ground. And another round struck the pavement directly in front of me. And it, luckily, it lost a lot of the velocity, um, but it still broke apart, and I still have a large piece in my chest to this day. So I was on the ground, again, not registering that I had been shot. Um, wasn't really in a whole lot of pain at the time. Uh, I was terrified. you know, And I remember looking up and, and seeing uh, a young boy uh, get struck near uh, the tetherball pole. I was just a few feet from him. He went down. He was actually fatally wounded. So I was able to get to my feet and um, made it made it to that wall. And I, I remember getting on the opposite side of that wall. And it's just a ply, plywood wall, maybe 8 or 9 feet, 10 feet tall. Fifteen feet wide, like a wall ball, just a handball wall. Handball wall, yeah, yeah. like a handball wall. Yeah. 
and I remember bracing myself and I remember the feeling of my foot just feeling very heavy, you know. And I remember wood just, just exploding over the top of my head, and that was the rounds coming through, coming through that wall. We're talking about cover and concealment. You know, this was concealment, it wasn't cover. Mm-hmm. And I look up and I had about another 50, 60 yard sprint to my classroom. And again, my classroom, the door opened up, you know, towards the, the playground. And that morning we had a substitute teacher and she was waving for kids to come in as the gunman is on the opposite side, almost in direct line of sight, firing into our playground. And she's standing there. She's just people just diving into the classroom. And I, and I, I remember looking up and I saw my friend Scotty. He was, uh, he was kind of sitting Indian style in the middle of the playground and he's just reaching up. Six-year-old kid just reaching up, and I remember a staff member coming, scooping him up, and running towards our, our classroom. And he dove in, and it was about the same time I I, I got in the classroom, and the, the teachers telling us, you know, get down, get down, get down. And uh, I I remember sunlight piercing through the walls, and the mm-hmm. sounds of the, the bullets hitting our metal desks, and um, just the drywall dust kind of floating through the air, with the, still the, the the rumble that low you know, sound of an AK going off outside. Kids are screaming. People are screaming. There's, I mean, there was a smell of blood, the iron smell. And, uh, but it it was weird because it was eerily quiet at the same time, Mm -hmm. you know, and all I, all I can do is, you know, I went to my desk and and my teacher, she said, get down. And I remember laying on the floor and I don't remember if she's telling us like cover our heads. I I remember kind of laying on the ground and, it seemed like it lasted forever, you know, and we heard the last shot and that was the gunman taking out a pistol and putting it in his mouth and, and ending his life. And again, what seemed like an eternity, you know, we're, we're sitting there and like, now what do we do? You know, and, and it's still, it's still not registering to me at least, you know, as a six year old kid, what had just happened? What, what did I just survive? You know, and I remember looking down at my shoe and you know, kind of sitting up at the time and, I had these uh, these new LA gears that I got for Christmas. And again, we came from a poor family, right? So having new shoes was a big deal. And uh, I, I wanted these shoes, you know. <laughs> and and uh, I remember seeing there was a hole on the inside of my foot and on, on the outside. And the bullet went clean through and blood was coming out of my brand new white LA gear shoes. And it pissed me off because my shoe was ruined, <laughs> you know. God. And uh, And... I, I remember being so mad and thinking I was going to get in trouble and great, you know, and not, not, I just been shot. It, it, that hadn't registered yet. The and mind I, of a six year old child. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just been shot I don't want to get in trouble. Don't for want to my get shoes. in trouble. <laughs> and, uh, wow. I remember looking down at my sweatshirt that I was wearing and, uh, it was, again, it was a Christmas present for my aunt and there was blood all over my chest. And again, it, it, it pissed me off, you know, the, these new clothes that are ruined now. And I remember looking over at Scotty and we weren't crying. I don't, I don't remember being in a lot of pain at the time. And I, I said, Scotty, I said, you know, look at my foot. And he's scooting over towards me. And he goes, Robbie, look at my leg. And Scotty had a hole in his, in his thigh. It was the entrance wound. You know, seemed about that big. And then the exit wound was like, like just a chunk. It just blown out of his thigh. And I don't remember it bleeding. A lot, you know, there was some, but I just remember just the the flesh that was just missing, you know, just a golf ball size hole. And that's when he told me, he said, you know, he goes, Robbie, I think, I think we've been shot. And then the wheels started turning in my head, and that six year old logic of only knowing what, you know, gunshots and people that have been shot. You know, the only knowledge I had of that was what I seen on TV, right? And so what happens on TV when somebody gets shot is they die, right? And that's when the fear kind of, like, started setting in. And, and uh, I remember thinking to myself, like, I, I can't die. Like, my, my mom's not here. My dad's not here. This is not how it's supposed to happen. Like, you know, it wasn't necessarily the fear of death itself. It was a fear of I'm, I don't have my family with me. Mm. And... Uh, you know, I'm, I remember just kind of looking around and it's, you know, then I'm realizing like, there's a lot of people hurt. You know, there's a lot of people that are, they're messed up, you know, and, and, 
and the people there was even students and staff members that weren't shot but they're just in shock and they're just and they were hurt you know and there were some other injuries that happened people getting trampled and you know people that fell and scraped you know got scraped up or whatever and just just again utter chaos and i remember you know finally the the paramedics and the police officers get into our classroom and you know i, I vividly remember the look on their face was just just shock you know and they yeah, they're not ready for this either. No, and this was eight, 1989 where, you know, again, like this didn't happen. Like active shooter wasn't a term back then. Right. Right, like it is now. Everybody, you know, we say active shooter. Everybody knows what we're talking about. Active shooter. We said an active shooter in 1989. That, what's that? Like, you know, is that a competition or what, you know? <laughs> is that game show or, you know? Um, but that that's what we experienced that day. And and I, I just remember the, the look on their faces and and – they did what paramedics do and first responders do. And they, they came in and started triaging and started cutting off clothes. And I, I, again, the logic of a six year old, I remember thinking like, if I stop this guy from working on me, maybe this all goes away. Mm. Right? Maybe it's not really happening if, if I don't let him work on me. And, and I had a very f like big fear of needles and, and they're, they're you know, trying to stick me with IVs and morphine. And and I remember biting the paramedic's hand, and I remember him just standing up, and he just, I'm pretty sure he cussed, you know, and <laughs> bit him pretty hard. And uh, my kindergarten teacher from the year prior just happened to be in, in that classroom. And she comes in, and she and I were really close. You know, she used to call me Huggy Bear. And uh, her name was Miss Zanganella. You know, God rest her soul. You know, this Italian lady. And she kneels down, and, and she, her lips just quivering, and she's crying. And she grabs my face, and very sternly, stop it. Stop it. They're, they're helping you. You have to stop. You have to let them help you. And I remember looking at her in her eyes, and, 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 and I could tell how painful it was for her to, to, to say that to somebody that she cared about, mm -hmm. you know, a little kid, right? And the paramedic... You know, he he said something that that has always stuck with me and something that, you know, being a first responder now is, is, is something that I always keep in mind is he looked at me and he said, you know, right now, young man, he said, you're going to be OK. He said, pain is a good thing. It means you're alive. Mm. And that gave me some hope. And I was like, OK. And I, and I laid there and I let them do what they needed to do. And they hooked me up to oxygen, put me on a backboard you know, strapped me down and, and uh, moved me out to the, the front of the school where they had, you know, a triage center set up on the front lawn. Probably every ambulance and firefighter in the county was there. Every law enforcement agency was there. And Stockton's pretty unique. You know, we have several different police departments in town. It's not just the city PD and the sheriff's office. I mean, we have university PDs, community college PDs, port PD, you know, yeah. school district police. I mean, everybody was there. People were coming in from, from home, you know, they were off duty because they just, it was all hands on deck. And uh, I remember laying there and kind of sitting up and just looking around and again, just, just seeing just devastation on people's faces, you know, and it was, it was pretty sickening, you know. So f five children were killed that day. Yeah. And almost 30 Shot, wounded. Yeah, there was one one teacher. <clears throat> I believe it was. I've seen twenty nine, and I've also seen thirty two. The number, and and I need to do some more research on that. I, I believe it was about thirty people. Yeah. Um. Yeah, four girls and a boy were killed. I knew two of the girls from my kindergarten class from the year prior. Um. And uh, yeah, I um, got loaded into an ambulance. They they took me to the the next town over, which is Lodi, and they took me to a doctor's hospital there, and and uh, they got me in, and they were real concerned about the the bullet wound. It was a shrapnel wound, but it was a pretty big round that hit me in the chest, and they were, they were real worried about that. And I, I get there, and you know, I remember them talking about surgery, the possibility of opening me up, but they did their scans, they they worked me up, and realized that it didn't hit any major arteries and it literally fishtailed around, you know, my heart and lungs and everything else. And just, it lodged itself in a pretty safe 
place considering and the round that that went through my foot um they said if i was an adult i would have probably lost my foot uh, they they speculate um, that this was my foot that the round entered here and it came out here didn't hit a bone mm. and they think because i was so young you know i guess you know young people their their bones are, are soft and pliable and they think the the expended energy pushed my bones out of the way and the bullet was able uh, to go through, right through my foot. So I was very, very lucky to survive those, you know, those wounds. Wow. And so, you know, remember I said my mom worked at the medical center. So she was a, just a CNA. You know, she was working in the cancer unit at the time and she's two miles from the school and they started uh, getting ready to bring some, some kids in and Somebody asked her, they said, Brenda, you know, um, did you hear about the, the school shooting that just happened? She's like, no, where? And they said, Cleveland. She's thinking Cleveland, Ohio. And she's like, okay, well, that's horrible, you know, and wasn't registering with her talking about Cleveland school, you know, where she just <laughs> dropped me dropped off that morning. Dropped her son off, yeah. I said, yeah, we're getting ready to take an influx of a lot of the, the injured here. And she just started freaking out. And, and she's, she's working at the she's hospital. She's working at the hospital. And she said about that time, she turned around and her boss uh, came out of the nurse's station and said, Brenda, we have a phone call for you. And she walks over, and she grabs the phone, and it was doctor's hospital in Lodi. It was a nurse. Said, Mrs. Young, um, your son's been injured. and we need, you to, we need you to come to Lodi. And she said, is my son okay? Is he alive? And she said, well, I can't tell you that over the phone, ma'am. We need you to... We need you to come. And she's like, oh, my God. No, you're going to tell me if my son's alive. And she says, ma'am, all I can tell you is that your son is alert and he's asking for you. Yeah. And so, you know, luckily her boss had the, the, the right mind not to let my mom, you know, she didn't have a car anyway, but, yeah. you know, didn't let her go by herself. And she put she's, her in her She's car. already going to be doing 100 miles per hour regardless. So right. now let's at least calm it down a little bit. Right. And, and she, she called my dad at his job and told him, you know, hey, we need to go to Lodi. And he said, I'll, I'll, I'll be right there. He jammed and met, met her at the hospital and had to push through some crowds and able to get in. But there was no stopping my parents. They, they got into that room. And, you know, the doctors let them in. And I remember seeing my mom. And I remember thinking, like, all right, it's going to be okay. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> so. Well, man, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, Matt acknowledges the shit out of that because it's it's hard to share and, and like I've always said that that's what this that's what we want this this channel to be whatever you want to call it is um, it's a forum life's a forum the yeah. world's a forum and the more we share the more we can we can maybe understand you know or, or add some light in somebody else's life so I, I, I know you did that um, by, by sharing that even mothers and fathers out there that listen to that it's like you need to visually prepare yourself in the event that something bad happens to your children not just a shooting I mean imagine if you get a call and your kid impaled himself riding a bicycle you know right. it's like you still have to prepare yourself for that um, especially in a worst case scenario like a shooting and, and which you know a lot of the parents in the, in the country right now are, are feeling um, whether their child is no longer with us or whether they are injured, they're still feeling the same exact feeling instantly. And it's a, it's the, probably the most helpless feeling that you can have as a parent uh, to not know, to have that uncertainty right. in your face. Um, and I would have probably done the same thing your mom did. Like, no, 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 you will tell me right now. I need more information. Um, but that's crazy. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Because you don't hear about the, the Stockton Schoolyard Massacre anymore. Um, you know, I, I've, I've heard of it. I mean, I've been around for a yeah. little while. But, uh, you know, I know we put out the question the other day and said, hey, you know, we got somebody that's in the first mass school shooting. Oh, Columbine. Like, well, that's what America thinks is the first you know, mass shooting. And that's not that's not the case. Right. No. We just didn't know what that was back then. And I think in a Columbine time is when they started going, OK, this is the thing. We need to probably identify this and start creating uh, TTPs and policies on how to how to maybe deal with this a little bit better. Um, well, anyways, I want to know more about you, man. Tell us. Tell us about your life. Like, what, what happened next? Right, you're six and a half years old. Um, you're you're you know you got your your mom, dad, right, and family. Yeah. Tell me about your upbringing, your family, and how did you get to where you're sitting right now? So I'm one of five boys. I'm the middle of, of five boys. My both my parents were were married briefly uh, before they got together, and uh, my mom had two boys from a previous marriage, and my dad didn't have any other kids. I'm I'm my dad's oldest, you know, biologically, uh, but he you know he got with my mom when 
my older brother above me was like three weeks old. You know, I mean, he's he's always been there. And, um, you know, we like I said, we, we grew up pretty poor, you know, and that we my parents always kind of struggled with some substance abuse and, and alcoholism. You know, my dad drank pretty heavy. Good man, you know, but he passed away three and a half years ago from congestive heart failure due to the drinking. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, I, it's never been easy growing up, right? Um, we were very poor, moved around a lot. I mean, I, I lost count at like 23 times. You know, I've lived in motels. I've lived in cars. I've lived in, you know, on the floor of, you know, my aunt's house. Uh, there was, there was six or seven of us between me and my cousins and my aunt and uncle and my mom and dad living in a two bedroom, you know, former schoolhouse at one time, you know, just a tiny little 700 square foot home, you know, mm. um, we moved around a lot. Uh, stability just wasn't a thing. Right. Um, my, my uncles on my mom's side, they all struggled with substance abuse. Uh, so that, that was really like my normal growing up, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up around a lot of cops other than the ones that responded to my house to deal with my mom on one of her fits or, you know, dealing with my brothers who were out, you know, breaking into cars, stealing cars. And, you know, my, my brother's getting arrested, you know, constantly. Um, and I did what I had to do, you know, at a certain point, you know, um, before my baby brother was born, I was 12 when he was born. Um, I had another little brother, I have another little brother named Aaron, and, you know, I, I had to be kind of his parent. Um, we didn't have food half the time, um, didn't have electricity half the time, or running water sometimes, you know, and honestly, you know, Child Protective Services should have probably taken us, but nobody ever called, mm. you know, at least that I know of. Um, and growing up like that, I, I, I realized that I just, I, I didn't want to be that. You know, and I love my family, but I, I, there was a time where I really had to start separating myself from them to an extent, right? Um, just because of their lifestyle. I, I didn't want to be around it. And um, again, you know, I, I never, I, was, I wasn't a criminal. I didn't, you know, I never hurt anybody or anything like that. Um, I think I told you, you know, every fight that I, I got into growing up was with bullies. You know, it's just... Who I was protecting people, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could sit there and you know talk crap about me all day, and I'm not gonna really lose my my cool, you know. But the moment you start picking on somebody who's you know a little bit weaker, that that struck a chord with me. Yeah, um, it's interesting because your family history is you know not that right from what it sounds like. No, um, but I uh, you know I realized that that, that lifestyle is not for me. I, I didn't I didn't want to do drugs. I didn't want to go to jail. That definitely wasn't for me. And when I was 20 years old, I was presented with an opportunity. I was, I was actually looking at different branches of the military and going away. And, you know, what kept me from, from not signing up for the Marines, you know, that's what I wanted to do was the fact that it was hard for me to leave my brother, mm -hmm. my brothers now, um, because I want to make sure they were taken care of. And so I, I procrastinated on that. And then when I was 20, I, I still hadn't you know, done anything like that. But I was presented with an opportunity to join the police academy, at least take the, the written test. And uh, I talked to um, the admission folks at the, the community college there, and I was able to get into the last test that year. And just, I, I always wanted to be a cop. You know, it was it was a lifelong dream of mine. Yeah, you told me from like three years old or something like that, right? Your dad yeah. said that's what you wanted to be. Right. I always get the question, well, did the shooting, did that really like propel you into law enforcement? Well, it, it definitely solidified it and strengthened it. But it, no, I mean, even before that, three, four years old, you know, daddy, I want to be a cop. Mm. You know, just something that was just in me. And so when I had that opportunity to test, I took the last test of the year and I actually got the last seat in the class that year. And, I, you know, started out 75 cadets in our class and graduated 34 and I was one of the 34 uh, turned 21 did it be 21 to be a cop in, in California I turned 21 at, uh, eight days before my graduation and still didn't have a job lined up because I, I paid my way through it I had to work you know to, to get through it you know and I don't remember sleeping for like 10 and a half months I just you know I'd wake up at 4 30 in the morning I was working at a grocery store and you get off 
early afternoon and study and get my uniforms prepped and shine my shoes and you know I had to be at the college you know to, to do what academy recruits do and put myself through and got through it and it was hard you know and I uh, was looking at different departments and at the time there was a big hiring freeze in California and I looked at Stockton Police Department I looked at the sheriff's office and I knew the the police chief at the school district police department and I called him and asked him if he was hiring. He said, I am. And he said, why don't you apply? And I did. And I applied, and I think I was sworn in maybe two months later. Mm. <laughs> so after doing the background check, and at the time, I, I, I didn't have my own place to live. In fact, I didn't even have my own car. I, I was borrowing a car from a buddy of mine and sleeping in his basement, you know, two towns over. <laughs> so, so that's why you became a cop so you get a car issued to you yeah pretty, well, <laughs> didn't have a take-home car i wish i did you yeah, know right. i think i think my first patrol car we, we didn't make much money back then i think i was making like 2400 a month or something you know yeah. when i got hired and my first police Damn. car was a uh Rolling. it was like a 95 chevy lumina <laughs> with the rotator you know you, you're, you're lucky you did that because i got paid 1100 a month as a marine yeah <laughs> my first year in yeah but at least they fed you it's a good point. Yeah, yeah. They did. yeah <laughs> you cops know? don't get fed. That's true. Yeah. So I no. find this interesting though, man, because I know I know uh, you know we were sitting there earlier and and we said talking about your name and stuff. You know, uh, Rob James Young, and um, and now I'm kind of putting two and two together. You come from a, a family of outlaws, man. I do. I do. I, I've always been told. Hence, uh, why I ask you why James. Well, <laughs> so <laughs> I've always been told since I was little that I'm named after Jesse James. The, the outlaw, which is your, which I, he showed us the paperwork, the documentation on this, and it shows he's a direct descendant and third generation yeah, from Jesse James. I didn't create that website, man. It's, no, it's that's out real. That's your it's, name, your date of birth, everything's in there. That's right. pretty cool. That's so cool. yeah, I'm named after an outlaw. So I think that's an interesting story there because I, I I encounter a lot of people, you know, that have a similar story, um, that will blame their potential ancestral genetics or their family and their upbringing and say like, yeah, I just that's that's I'm a product of my environment. Well, not you. You were you were the one, right? So sometimes it takes. Um, I think there's a book or something out there. I'm, I've been trying to find. It's called "It Only Starts with One" or yeah. "It Starts with One." It starts with one. I think that's what it is. I forget the author, but interesting. You know, I'm going to look that up because yeah, that's what you're doing. You change that dynamic in, in the family um, because of a higher power, compassion to yeah. to serve people, and I think it's all tied together with your life experience as a kid, and yeah. and you're still doing that to this day. Yeah, I you know I don't I don't prescribe to being religious or anything like that, but I do have a you know a relationship with God. You know, I mean, it, I really do. I really think that He has a calling and a purpose on my life. You know, and that's you know I was talking to you last night about it. You know, and I, I really you know there's that there's that scripture that I shared with you in the Romans eight twenty eight. It says all things work together for the good for those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. And I really do believe that my life course has been you know propelled by a higher power. So, you know, call it that. Call it divine appointment. Yeah, all things working together. For the good. It doesn't say all things are good. It says all things work together for the good. All things work together for the good. That's I've never heard that. Um, well, I, that kind of a, is a great segue into, you know, why we're here today. You know, besides just us, you know, building a relationship and, and understanding your story. and um, But, you know, we look at this history of these, these situations in the country. You know, the, the history of uh, what we used to call hyper killers and then active killers and active shooters. And, and, uh, and I think that's kind of important too, because a lot of people will take that word and, and, and not understand it a hundred percent. And I think that, you know, I, I always went off of the hyper killer concept because, you know, I can, I can find situations like in China in the subway where that guy took a knife and killed 22 people just like that. I think right. it was 22 people, right. Where the Rwanda genocide where 98% of people were killed with machetes and that was a million people in less than a year. Um, so what do you call that? You know, Boston Marathon. Boston Marathon. That's not a that's not an active shooter. Um, those are IEDs, and, right. and I'm shocked that people haven't gotten smarter. You know, yeah. I'm, God forbid that 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 starts happening more. Because um, I know what that terror feels like driving down the road every day and knowing you're going to vaporize any second, <laughs> and there's yeah. nothing you do about it. So like you imagine that happening, people aren't taking their kids to school. You're not going to the grocery store. I remember living in D.C. and I was working out of D.C. Uh, for about a year, and it just happened to be during the D.C. sniper. You remember that? Yeah, I do. And uh, this guy and his kid were going around the city, the, the beltway of D.C., and um, sniping people from their trunk. The Chevy Caprice, right? Yeah. yeah, and they were shooting through that loophole. 
and killing people at gas stations and stores and everything else. And I, my son was in, I was stationed in Camp, Camp um, I was stationed in Camp Lejeune. So I started driving back and forth to Pennsylvania. And then I went up to DC, moved up there to Bethesda and started driving back and forth. And now I remember putting armor on driving around mm-hmm. because I had to drive around. And then I was like, man, I got to go get my son this weekend. And so I go up and get him. And I was the most scared out of my mind being a special operations guy working for the government now in, in DC and scared to drive around with my kid. I had him all armored up and everything. I was paranoid. Yeah. You know, I was paranoid to a point I was prepared, but cause I, my son's got a plate carrier over him and he's th- two years old, three years old at the time. Uh, but I'm looking back in the mirror going, why, why am I doing this? Yeah. Because I'm scared. I'm scared to have a round come impacting through my, my car and hitting my son. Rightfully so. And so that terror is, is very real out there. And that terror is something that I think everybody needs to realize is a constant in the world. Evil will always be a constant. You will never get rid of it. You will never get rid of evil. Right. And if anybody thinks that that is a, 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 we can all put a coexist sticker on our car and just get along, which again, not, I want to coexist, right? Because the last person that people that have, Absolutely. the last thing that people have seen violence want is violence. And so I want to make sure that, that people understand that that's the last thing I ever want to have to do again is, is go into harm's way for others. But I would do it in a heartbeat. Absolutely. Because that's just my makeup, man. Um, but I, that fear. I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I've been in, I've been in shooting. I've been, I was in, a, you know, an officer ball shooting in 2013. And I remember thinking, man, you know, I remember saying out loud, I, I don't want to be here. And but, then I, and then I shot him six times, you know, and yeah. it, it's, it's. I don't want to ever have to do that again. You said you don't want to be there as you're shooting him. I actually said it out loud. And I was one of six officers who opened fire. And it was an actually, it was actually active shooter. Luckily, nobody got hit. But the guy was walking through a neighborhood with a, a 45 and a machete. And he was shooting at passing motorists and, you know, people walking their dogs. And I remember seeing people hiding behind trees and behind cars. And in my mind, we got on scene, we had some dialogue with him. But I'm thinking, like, we have to end this now because there's people bleeding out right now. Yeah. And I can't let this keep happening. I have to stop that threat. And, you know, he was he was pointing the gun down at, at the ground. It's on video, you know, and, and he's taunting us and he raised on us and we do what we had to do. And I don't ever want to have to do that again, but I'll do it again every day if I have to. Well, that's what that's people, my job. And, and Rob, I think that's an important point where people need to realize that. Because I'm sure there's a lot of people that just heard that. I'm like, screw that guy, man. Shoot him. Kill him. I would have shot him right away. Why'd you hesitate? Well, because of of the number one principle of a warrior, compassion. Your heart yeah. is what makes you not want to have to do that. And you will have empathy for everybody, even the criminals, right? I have empathy for criminals because I was a criminal as a right. kid. I was in and out of jail. I was not the best kid. I was, I was more curious. I wasn't a criminal. I was right. more curious and got my ass in trouble because I didn't know the law. Um, and you as well, you, you grew up in a, a hard life. You understood those people, you yeah. know, that we look at and go, Oh, that's those people. They're criminals. Like, no, they're mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters. And, you know, and, and I know that that hits you hard recently with a situation yeah. that I think is important maybe to talk about here because everybody is going active shooters, active shooters, active shooters. Well, guys, I need you to realize that active shooters have been around since the 1700s. Okay. Number one, number two, they're never going to stop. Number three, Active shooters is, is a very loose term, right? Because if you look at, we were just looking at the city of Chicago. So Chicago has had seven active shooter situations in the last month. Yeah. Seven. That's multi-victim drive-bys or gang-related type incidents. So, and I ask people, what is the difference between me going into a school, a church, or wherever in a store and shooting five people Versus me doing a drive-by and shooting five people at a barbecue. Is there any difference? There's not. Why does the city of Chicago, for one my, um, you know, very tiny example, does not identify that as active shooters? It's just gang-related violence. Right. right? Um, but there's still five people dying, right? There's 129 people were killed or homicides this month in, in Chicago. 129. Right. Add that up compared to the last five active shooter scenarios. doesn't match up. So that's an issue for me. And then sometimes just absolute heinous crimes that are committed that nobody ever hears about. Yeah. Right. And, and can you share that a little bit that you kind of started sharing with us? Yeah. It, without, um, I know it's still under investigation. But. Yeah. Mid April, um, again, in Stockton. Um, and again, I have to be very careful on what I do say because this is an ongoing court case and, you know, well, just speak to what's out in the news. Yeah. You know? So basically a, a 15 year old student, female student was, um, she just got dropped off by her, you know, her mom and she's late to school, late to school. 
and for a valid reason, you know, and, um, as she's walking to class, uh, she was walking past some, some doors that were exposed to, you know, the parking lot area of the school. And it's a very active campus. There's probably three, 4,000 people, you know, at any given moment, there's FedEx trucks coming in and out. I mean, it's just an active, it's an active school, you know, mm-hmm. active parking lots. And people don't realize too, that they, they always say, you know, how did the person get on campus? Well, there's a business part of a campus too. So, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta slow down with that. It's know? not a prison. It's not a prison. What, right. You know, and, and they say, well, I don't want my schools being a prison. Well, do you or do you not? You know, but anyway, that's besides the point. So this girl was uh, walking to class and unbeknownst to her, there was a 52 year old male who made it into the parking lot and just a few feet from the parking lot. And there, there was a row of classrooms that you know are exposed uh, doors locked, thankfully. Um, and as she goes to walk by him, he had a chef knife and stabbed her to death. Grabbed her and stabbed her. We don't know why. How many times? Uh, I've been told it was about 27 wounds. 27 stabs yeah. from a chef's knife on a school campus to a 15-year-old girl that was just dropped off by her mom. Yeah. And so I was actually one of the first responders on that scene. I was there probably a minute and a half after it happened. And, uh, you know, we had, the, we had the guy in custody within less than a minute. He gave up. You yeah. know, and, and, again, I have to be very careful what I say. Sure. You know, but uh, – you know, people say, you know, why, why isn't he dead? Well, we didn't have that option, you know, according to our laws and stuff like that, because he'd, he'd, he'd given up. Yeah, I so. know everybody's thinking, like, oh, why would you let somebody like that live? Well, still America, still a legal system, and unfortunately we have to abide by it, otherwise we go to jail. <laughs> because we'd, we'd have a police officer that'd be in prison right now for, for homicide. Leaving his, fam- leaving his family behind, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's a, it was very unfortunate, you know, but I mean, these things happen and I, and I hate saying that, but it, it really is. You're never going to get rid of evil. Evil is always going to exist. Yeah. Right. And, you know, these suspects, I mean, they can, they can have whatever reason they have. It's just pure evil. You know, didn't the family show up right after that? Or is that yeah not something to talk about? Yeah. I mean, I, again, I have to be very yeah. careful, you know. but that's, I imagine that, you know, mom had to come back at a certain time. Dad had to find out about it. And, and I know, you know, that's, that's happening in the country right now. People yeah. are questioning everything. And so uh, the biggest questions that we get are, how do we do this? How do we, how do we fix this problem? Well, uh, I don't know. What's your, what's your solution, man? I mean, I know there's no perfect solution, but like yeah. if, I don't know, is there, is there an ideal, like, hey, if we push this button and this happened, it would actually make it safer? I don't know. Is there that thing? There's, there's no absolutes. You know, we've had the opportunity to, to really bounce ideas off each other the last couple of days. And, you know, I've been trying to figure this out my entire career, really. And, and even before I was a police officer, how does this how does this happen? How do we how do we stop this? And I really had to think back and think really, really hard and not base my conclusions. I, I can't base those off of pure emotion. Right. I have to base my conclusions off of experience and not have a knee jerk reaction on either side of the spectrum. Right. I think we, we as Americans and we as people and, and as a as a huge community, we, we have to be careful not to do that. And so I do know this. Schools are a very soft target. Why? You know, you always hear, yeah, we have, you know, these signs that say gun, you know, it's a gun free zone. Right. And I don't think guns are just necessarily the answer. I think it's one of, one of the answers. I'm, I'm very pro second amendment. Um, but I'm, I'm not, I don't so want you're to, not the person that's going to say guns are the problem. No, I'm not. Would you be of the mindset where you'd say mental health issues are the problem as well. It's part of it. Because that's the dual argument that people always go, oh, it's not about guns, it's about mental health. Well, it's not about mental health, it's about guns. I, I think it's a big part of it, absolutely. And and again, you know, like I said in the beginning, that there's no absolutes. Um, I do know it's a problem when there's people that have had training and that are lawful gun owners, and they may be able to lawfully carry concealed in public. They can walk into banks, they can walk into the grocery store, and they can drive around town, and they're able to lawfully can carry a concealed weapon. I think it's a problem when you have guys like a guy that I worked with who had over 30 years in law enforcement 
worked for three different agencies in our town, mm. got out of law enforcement literally over 30 years and went into teaching at one of our public schools. God bless him. Why? I don't know, <laughs> but you know, he didn't want to sit at home. Um, and, and this guy was a sergeant for many of those years. So not only was he just a police officer, he was a supervisor. And when he was teaching in that classroom, he couldn't carry his gun that because it was against the law years. because he's a civilian. But yet six months prior to that, you dial 911, he was expected to, to carry a gun on the campus. And I, and I, I don't think that you get your teacher credential and we hand you a Glock or we hand you, you know, a, you know, a six hour and say, Hey, you know, congratulations, welcome to teaching, or here's your janitor job, and here's your, here's your broom, and here's your, you know, your Glock 19, now, now go to work. But we have those people that have the mindset, have the training, have the know-how, and have the willpower to run towards a, a threat and neutralize a threat, right? They have that skill set. You know, if I took you, Travis, for whatever reason, you woke up tomorrow, and you say, you know what, I, I think I'm going to go be a football coach. Right? You have a background in football, correct? I do. Right. But could you carry a, a firearm on campus when you're working with those football players right now? I, I don't know. Arizona law. Might no, be no, you can't. I'm just uh, that that uh, Bruce Willis movie, the, the football one kept kicked in my head where the guy pulls out the gun from his last boy scout. <laughs> yeah, sorry. yeah. Sorry. My brain drifted really hard. <laughs> no, nah, That's a good movie. Uh, but, but no, I would not be able to carry a gun lawfully. Right. Lawfully. Right. On that campus. No, you would not. And that would be hard. I'd feel naked every and that, day. And Even though that's not the only weapon that you always have, this is the biggest up in the battlefield anywhere, your brain. Right, but but what's going to stop a bad guy with a gun? A gun. That's the only equalizer. Yeah, I would never go overseas into combat without my weapon systems. Exactly. Even though I'm extremely smart and resourceful, it does not stand a chance against people with weapons. And you can shoot. That's right. I've watched you for years. You train law enforcement military. You spent your entire adult life doing what you do and you've become a master of your craft and you teach excellence to people in our profession not just in firearms you know mind right. architecture i mean I did, M M M I, did, I did mma and different types of of arts for for forever for all my life as well on top of that but i wouldn't be able to rely on that in that type of situation but it's but it's a shame that you wouldn't be able to take all your tools to be successful and protecting our students and that's yeah. that's the point that i'm trying to drive home yeah and it's, I think it's this, not for everybody. And so I think that was one of the questions that somebody asked us on our channel today. They said, why is it so hard? Why is it so hard? And, and I'll, I'll go ahead and, and pull it up here. Um, why is it so hard to create a safe school? Um, that's one of these just here. And I, I asked him like, yeah, that's a really great question. Why is the schools the last soft targets in our country? Because here's the deal. I just got back from California. Now I know there's a lot of the, a lot of the, the, the country is this way. And some of the places aren't this way. Like if you went to Scottsdale uh, over here, you would not see what I saw in California. Right. So certain States have already identified that there's a big issue. Um, here it is. So yeah, it's, uh, I X I sweet sweat. I X I sweat. Sorry, brother. Uh, <laughs> Failure. What do you think is the single biggest issue preventing schools from being a safe space for students? Well, I don't know, because when I went to Bakersfield Walmart the other day and I was getting food for the course, uh, there was, we counted four armed guards at each, uh, two at each entrance and exit point uh, with Glocks on, with security, with handcuffs, and they were a contracted security company. In the parking lot, there was a big truck with lights on, circling constantly, and there was two, and I forget the name of the damn things, the, the you know, the, the portable law enforcement light thermal the stations. The trailers and stuff, yeah. These were thermal and portable camera systems in the parking lot with blue lights on them like a fob, like a right. military base at Walmart. Right. Why is Walmart all of a sudden a critical infrastructure? Well, maybe it might be for the government during bad times or FEMA shit, which I don't care about, but why can't we take that same approach at a school? Right. Because, you, I mean, I, I can see the reason. I know why. Because Walmart, you know, they, they draw huge crowds every day, you know. So, I mean, Especially you see the same at 1 thing. 1 o'clock in the morning. It's the finest of people. Right. Sorry. It's bad. Trolls. I, I, I carry a gun yeah. when I go to Walmart. And, Absolutely. And all and, and that's that's where I believe there needs that, that security. So that justifies because of the theft and, and all the fights and stuff that break out in those stores. So it justifies armed security and right. camera systems and guards and, 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 and enhanced and increased concentric rings of security 
but yet we go to the school and we don't have that, which also cracks me up because I've heard statistics that say, and you heard me say this earlier to Matt, there has never been a child that has died in a school-related fire in the history of the United States. Why? Was it because a paranoid firefighter stood up and said, hey, guys, this may happen. We may have a situation and right. people may die. So we're going to go ahead and put fire sprinklers and fire alarms and, and do fire retardant materials and make sure our doors and everything are, are, are good to go for evacuations. And we need to do fire drills like religiously, right. which we always did. And that is standardized across the country, right? Yeah. Would you agree to that? Yeah. It duck, is standardized. Duck and cover, remember those? Yeah, I could talk to guys drills. when I went to school in, in Florida in the in the, in the in the 80s and 90s, and then when I graduated, um, to uh, Mike, you know, Matt, we were talking to about this. He's he's in his 60s, and same thing back then. And then if I ask a kid of today, yeah, we still do fire drills, and it's all the same thing. But as it pertains to active shooters or active killers in a school, there is zero standardization across the country. Zero no. standardization across the country. That is a fact because that's a fact because if you look at a fire department right here and then I go to California, you look at a fire department, there are going to be a lot of the same TTPs and policies Absolutely. because fire is fire. Proven um, methods and stuff that they, there's a science behind of what they do. So why is it when 14 agencies show up on a scene in an active shooter situation, every agency is doing something different. Nobody communicates effectively. The fucking incident commander forgets his radio right. and then makes excuses and then takes and changes the call from an active shooter to a barricaded suspect, which never, ever, 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 ever should happen if you're a law enforcement officer because just because planes hit the building doesn't mean the terrorist attack is over. It doesn't turn into a rescue mission all of a sudden. It's a terrorist attack. Yeah. It's an active shooting situation. So I think people get wrapped around the wrong, the wrong thing here. Um, I, I worked in the East Bay uh, for nine years. I worked for the Union City Police Department. Great agency. Really good agency. And, and they, did, they did a heck of a job, you know, training us. You know, I mean, we weren't a huge agency. We didn't have all the money in the world, but we, we, did, a, we did it pretty, pretty well. And, um, you know, I, I became a, a school resource officer. Because even, even when I was a city cop, you know, I was always looking at the schools as just, you know, patrolling around the schools. I, I just, I've always been drawn to it, obviously, because of my story. And um, one thing that I commend them on was one of my lieutenants pulled me aside. He said, hey, man, I know your story. I, I know your background. Um, and one of the things that I want to implement is all of our SROs, which I was the only one in the department at the time, uh, become active shooter response instructors. And so I, I remember going to those drills and really paying attention and trying to learn as much as I could and, and, and going, yeah, this is awesome. But I, I got to go, you know, get certification in that. And, um, you know, I, I took that back when I became a, when I left that agency and, and, and went back to Stockton as a sergeant, um, the Stockton Unified as a sergeant, I said, one of the things that I want to bring back is I want to start doing active shooter drills and I want to, I want to include all of the law enforcement and all the EMS agencies um, and, and, and really test the full gamut of our county and the structure of our county for, for first responders. Yeah, that takes a community, not an individual it, it, it's, organization. It's huge. And I was able to be a part. There was actually a big exercise coming up, and they brought me on as one of the proctors. And, and it was really cool because we took it beyond, you know, taking over a school and doing an active shooter drill. We had the active shooter drill, and we had officers respond from different areas of the city. And we invited, like I said, all the ambulance companies and fire departments to come and play. It wasn't mandatory, but we had a lot of people show up. And we brought in, you know, full Hollywood makeup artists and, you know, uh, actors. And um, it, was, it was as real as it gets, right? And we tested the full response and coordination and... Um, all of the departments working together, you know, we'd had CHP and, you know, the city police and the sheriff's office and probation and parole and all of the agencies that work in town show up and we put together rescue task forces and, you know, uh, contact teams and, and everything else and said, okay, you know, we got a, we got a call. There's a, there's a hostage in this room and there's a guy upstairs killing everybody. Go. How fast did that work out? <sighs> They were able to neutralize the threat within two minutes of getting on scene. They, they had to make their way, get in a couple of firefights yeah, and make their that's way pretty up. pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty cool. um, and then they had to deal with, you know, not, not only neutralizing the threat upstairs, but we had the hostage downstairs. Yeah. And so they had to, you know, call out H&T, call out the resources that you call out, right, yeah. and, and figure it out. And I think that we had like 117 casualties 
um, some fatal, some critical, some not with walking wounded, how are you going to get them out? And then we tested the EMS response and said, okay, in real time, you know, how many ambulances do you have available right now? And how are you going to get these people without actually transporting them, you know, in real life, but we're going to transport them. So how are we getting them there? What hospitals are you going to? And then we called the hospitals and didn't tell them beforehand. We got a hold of their, their directors and we said, okay, we're doing a drill. We want it real time. And we had to get the trauma centers involved. And you have this many beds. You have this many patients coming in. Where are you putting them? It's right. the hardest thing about combat is right. casualty evacuation. Right. Yeah. And then we dealt with the school district <laughs> officials and said, okay, reunification, notifications, aftermath, what are you doing? And we tested that too. And it was, it was an eye-opener. But what's sad is, you know, I, I promoted in 2016, and I think we've had two big drills in six and a half years. How many fire drills? <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's not enough. It's never enough. It's never enough. Well, I think a lot of people will say, well, that's a great congratulations on your big, massive county response. But what about the individual that got there first? Like, what is his job? Um, that's a big question, you know, and, and again, we have everything from Columbine. We learned a lot of lessons from, um, you know, and, and today, all the shootings that we can research. Broward County was a great one where we went through the Parkland High School um, we actually were called in to come in there about two weeks later after that situation and do an assessment and, and actually do training in mind architecture and a lot of, a lot of different, um, you know, a lot of great conversations were had. And, and most all the guys that were there were like, look, we don't, we don't have all the answers and we were there, you right. know? Um, but they do know that response times were slow. And in one of the videos in that particular after action, you can see a cop pull right up to the building and he takes a minute and 44 seconds to put on his vest and get mm. his carbine out while he's getting shot at by the actual shooter out the hurricane glass window, but the, the hurricane glass was, was shredding his bullets apart and never hit the officer. Nothing takes a, hundred, a minute, minute, 44 minute, minute 44 seconds. No. A minute 44 seconds, I should be clearing half the school. Cleveland okay, school was over in less than three. Three minutes. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't take long. And that's another good question. You know, a lot of people go, SROs need to be doing their job, and they're under, under – well, first off, let's, let's, let's make sure everybody understands – I believe the last time I checked the statistics, only about 29% of schools have school resource officers in the country. And a lot of those are shared. Like we have three schools right here around us and one officer will rotate between those three schools that I know of. Okay. Right. That means they get done doing traffic in the morning and they break down and they go to the next school. So they're a show of force for 20 minutes and then they leave and go be a show of force somewhere else. And then they might bounce around from school and then, you know, take that turn. So if one school gets lit up and the SRO is over here, they've got to get in their car and, and respond just like every other officer would be in Potentially another officer would be there first because it's their zone. Right. And where um, now that school resource officer gets blamed for not being there. And an example for you, I think you said your campus is 64 acres. One of the one of the campuses I worked on uh, as a school resource yeah, officer uh, in the Bay Area, it was 64 and a half acres at James Logan High School. That's and a long freaking ways. Yeah. So, you know, I tell people, I said, OK, yeah, we had an SRO. I was assigned to that school full time. That was my that was my beat. Right. And. What happens when I'm on corner X and the gunman enters at corner C on the opposite side of the, the campus and I got to hoof it over there, right? What do you think my response time is going to be? You know, say, I used to live on a 15-acre property. It took me five minutes to sprint across it. You? And I was in shape. I was a track runner as an athlete, and I, would right. be, I, was, I was fast. Yeah. That's, Travis Haley is going to outperform Rob Young any day. I guarantee you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, but uh, – don't, yeah. you say that. <laughs> Don't you say that? Don't you say that? No, but I mean that's a that's a reality. And then next thing you know, we're blaming the SRO. Now there are certain times and in, in cases where I, I don't really agree with now that Parkland has been, you know, there's a big gap of time there. We can look back in that and negligence not, there. There's a lot of negligence there from an from an SRO not responding, you know, correctly. Um, or not taking it seriously. Um, and I think the same thing that may potentially be happening in, in Texas. Texas, Texas right. is probably going to be one of our biggest blunders of, of a response because nothing takes an hour and 20 minutes to, to take out a threat. I'm sorry. Um, 78 minutes. I mean, damn, the boys and dev, you know, hitting bin Laden's compound took 40 something minutes, 43 minutes or something like that. And they hit fail breach after fail breach, lost a helicopter, but they practiced and they trained and they had this scale models of compound. the shit out of it. Yeah, we built scale models of, with engineers coming in to, to build the exact same compound that they did raids and hits on every right. day until it was time to go do the real thing. 
we in law enforcement don't do that. You know, I spent about eight years in law enforcement on, on more of a critical response type, you know, in training and weapons and technology development and volunteering uh, a lot of my time to that. And I realized it wasn't the same world. It's not. It's There's only 800,000 cops and police officers in the United States, and we're trying to police 328 million people. Um, that's not easy. You know, no. so we, it's, it's you know, like my kids asked the other day, I, I think I may have said this on another podcast where I was talking to, to, to Sheriff Mark Lamb, the American sheriff, and, you know, I, my kids asked me, Dad, is it okay to be a cop in today's world? And I had to sit and really think about that. And I responded after probably about a minute of thinking and said, no, it's not okay to be a cop in today's world, son. It's necessary. Yeah. For people. It doesn't mean he needs to do that. I'll, I'll support whatever he wants to do as long as he contributes to society in some way, shape, or form. However, man, that's a scary notion for him to go into that world right now, or even in the military right now with what's going on with our leadership. There is an absolute leadership issue that's Absolutely. out there. Um and I think our SRO programs are not real SRO programs, no. right? From what people think, because a lot of people would say an SRO's job is to respond to these types of situations and eliminate the threat. That's why we are paying taxpayer money to put a cop in that school. No, it's not. Like if you look at the SRO program, which you know very well, I mean, it's everything from, you know, uh, child freaking communication at age appropriate levels and drugs right. and conflict, you know, negotiation and making sure they stay out of the juvenile justice system Restorative and, justice and, and blah, 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 and ch- sex trafficking and drugs. And, and which is important, which is a big problem in our schools. So all those things, if you were to list off the SRO curriculum or program of instruction, you would say, yeah, every single one of those things are necessary. Now I think some gun toting fools out there would be like, no, nah, man, they need to be shooters. They need to be, no, they don't. They need to be law enforcement officers, which is, doesn't mean shooting everybody. <laughs> that's, the, that's the problem we're in in the country today Thinkers. is everybody thinks that cops shoot people. No, we have to think first before yeah. we act. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's hard, right? Just like we were doing some of the judgmental use of force training. It's rough. And you've been doing this all your life. And, man, you get stumped. I get stumped every time I go into that thing because I thought something was going to happen and it happened another way. Yeah. That's the reality of a gunfight. Right. And, and so it's very hard to Monday morning quarterback somebody else's gunfight. But we can certainly learn a lot from our past. And I think one of the things that we have not learned in law enforcement, and it could potentially be the bureaucracy and the politics. And, you know, because whoever your governor or mayor and and city council members are and your chief, and your sheriff in your local community, uh, it starts there. Yeah. So I think that's one of the biggest things that Americans can do when they ask, what do we do to fix this? Guys, we got it. We got to get back to America roots. We got to get back to making sure we get the right people in the right place. And I think that starts with family, man. You know, I teach my kids so they can teach their kids' kids. That's that's yeah. my mentality and with my children. And I teach them to be good community members. I teach them to go, you know, hey, if you see the neighbor's trash can out still after two days, take it in, please. Well, why, Dad? It's not ours. Well, here's the deal. If we were in that situation, let's say we went on vacation and we left our trash can out. Do you think that invites criminals to break in our house because they see the trash can out? Well, guess what bad guys do? They look at places and they go, oh, wow, this is an interesting time and place predictability. Nobody's there. There's 15 newspapers piling up on the driveway like they used to. Right. That's the majority. It's a newspaper. (laughs) It's a thing. It goes in a bag. (laughs) Anyways. It's like a phone book. What is that was an book? automatic indicator for professional criminals to go, well, obviously nobody's been home for a week or two. Right. And you count the papers and they know they're, they're not stupid. So I say by community policing, not only are we preventing bad situations from potentially happening, um, you're also building a bond with your neighbors. Absolutely. And when you do that, you get to know them. And then they start policing. You know, I say, hey, Bob, can you keep an eye on my kids? I got to run into town real quick while they're out there playing. Sure, man, go for it. I want to be able to trust my neighbors. And I think I, I asked the, the listeners right now, do you even know your next door neighbor? Right. I guarantee a lot of people in our community are going to say, yeah, of course I do. But I guarantee you a lot of people out there listening will be like, holy shit. Yeah, I don't even really, I've never even met my neighbor. I've lived here 10 years. I've never even met my neighbor. Yeah, I, I that, get that all the time. And I think that's that, that's such a, a disservice to you, to your neighbors, to your kids, to everybody around, because you're absolutely right. I live on a cul-de-sac. And uh, we bought this house about a year and a half ago. And I came from a cul-de-sac. And it was, it was like that in, in, in a city of Stockton where the crime rate's through the roof. I think we had a very safe cul-de-sac because everybody looked out for one another. I moved into this cul-de-sac and didn't know my neighbors. The first day of moving in, before I started, before we moved in, I showed up and took every opportunity to meet every single neighbor, right? Because I have to live with these people. I have to live next to them. And I have to be able to trust them. And, 
you know, and we do a good job taking care of our And I'm sure a lot of your neighbors are like, who, who, why are you coming to my house? Like there could be that potential thing and do not let that discourage you because that's the problem with our country is that we've created separation in our own community. Yeah. We don't talk to each other. We don't help each other out anymore. And so when, and I know people are like, what does this have to do with act, stopping active shooters? Guys, if you have a stronger neighborhood, a stronger community, what do you think your children are going to do? They're going right. to have more of an outlet, more of a communication with other people. They're going to start to realize what it means to contribute to society versus um, all the shit that we're dealing with right now. For example, you know, we have all these kids, like how many kids do we know that are on, you know, not only just, you know, the, the street drugs, but are on antidepressants at the age of nine and 10 years old now. Right. Psych meds. Um, and they have broken families potentially, which we all have. I mean, I have a broken family um, or we grew up in hard times and we're trying to medicate them which, of course, you, as you know, people need help, man. If Absolutely. they need the meds, they need the meds. And I'm all for that. Uh, but I'm also a holistic healer, too. And I want to make sure that I can I can do the right thing with mind architecture first. And then if I need to go into that, I will. But we have these kids that are getting drugged. They have shitty parenting strategies, which is the what if you were to ask me, what's the problem in the United States? Failed parenting strategies. Yeah. Failed parenting so, you know, we got a kid that just shot up a Texas school that was obviously a transgender child or trying to con- tr- trying to, to, to transform there. Uh, was finding on, identity. Was on antidepressants and a lot of yeah. drugs. Finding identity, yeah. Um, lived with grandma, but mom mom's in the picture on interviews all over the TV right now. So it was dad. Where, where were they? Right. You know, so I'm not going to judge their family. That's not my, my job because everybody has problems and I get right. it. But... If you're not involved with your children, you're a part of the problem. Absolutely. You're not a part of the solution. And if you're out there, you know, again, saying, um, well, you know, that's that's great. I don't really need to know my neighbor. But you're the one screaming, hey, we need to fix this problem, America. Maybe you should get to know your neighbor. Right. right? And I know that yeah. sounds so, I mean, almost cheesy or cliche in this world's environment. But that is, that's what makes the world go around is community. Right. Um, and, that's and why it, military organizations work, at least to a point, because we have community. That's a piece know? of the solution. I think everybody's looking for absolute answers, and, and we don't have an absolute answer. There's no absolute answer to every single issue, right? I think I think it's bits and pieces that you, you put together to get better. That reminds me of a question that somebody asked. Oh, this is from, um, insert name here, 1.0. <laughs> You really want me to answer the name? <laughs> <laughs> so no, he has a good he has a good question. I think a lot of parents may be in this situation that maybe we can we can add some value to for for people out there listening. Um, he said this is awesome because we asked this question the other night. Uh, because of this and the timing of how everything happened, my son's school held a board meeting in regards to the in- increasing their security. After attending and voicing my concerns, I got invited to the talking table, so to speak. Uh, with other members of the board so we can further discuss increasing security measures for the school. I guess my question is here, um, what should I do or what should be, sorry, what should be expected of me when speaking to those members so that actions can be done and not just be invited to get heard? And you've done a lot of this, so what, what do you? What would you suggest for somebody that's going to be a, have an opportunity to sit in front of a board of whoever and talk about these things? Insert name here. You're doing it. You have to get involved. And it can't just be your voice. I would challenge you to gather petitions, hold some maybe some, some side meetings with other parents in your community and go, you know, what do we need to do? What, what, what is it that we need to address? And, and be realistic on, on what you think the root cause is and go after it. Remember that you're dealing with elected officials, mm-hmm. <clears throat> okay? They want to keep their seat. A lot of them want to move on to bigger and better things and hold their, you know, their feet to the fire, you know, and say, no. But how do we you, do that with these you, corrupt, corrupt? You work for us. Like, you know, I, I mean, these elected officials, you don't, we don't have to vote for you next time, you know? And, and, and so, you know, I commend this this father for for getting involved because a lot of parents don't a lot of parents will just sit back and they'll they'll bitch and complain about you know oh this this needs to happen and people need to get involved and this needs to change and be the voice these are your children these are your kids these are our kids exactly these are the this is our future exactly that's what i was just going to say and and it's like we have to invest in them and we have to teach them also 
how to get involved in a, in a professional manner civically, right? That's right. And, 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 and be involved in your community because again, it's community. It's community. People are scared to step up, you know, and I think that's where they'll look at us and go, well, that's what you guys do. Should you need to be stepping up and doing this? And, um, I'm like, no, you're a father, you're a mother, you're a parent. You should step up. If you're not going to do it, who is? I mean, I've got seven kids now. Okay. With a blended family. And I know you have four kids in a blended family. Yeah. Um, yeah, we take this shit seriously Absolutely. because we may be responding to our own children's schools. Yeah. Um, so maybe before that happens, we can start at a, at the ground level, like the community level. I mean, it goes, um, it goes right in, you know, my, one of my neighbors, he's a, he's a combat Marine, you know, and his wife, she lives right, they live right across the street from us. And I, I commend her because she is gaining a voice. And this is a stay at home mom who started fighting the mask mandates saying, this is not right. This is affecting our children negatively. Right. And she brings science involved and she gets, you know, doctors on her side and she's actually out there down on the pavement and she's getting petitions. Right. And she's gotten, she's gotten the, you know, the, the, uh, she's gotten the attention of our, our, our local leaders, you know, the superintendent. You have of to our stay persistent. And, exactly. Yeah. But yeah. you have to, you have to be able to pound the pavement and you have to be able to do the work and you have to stay consistent. Yeah. Right. And you can't just be one voice. Yeah. And something like that. So if you're going to the town hall meetings and these school board meetings and everything, man, good for you because not a lot of people are doing it. I think, and I know you'll agree with this when, because you know, people are like, well, I can stand up there and yell as loud as I want, but these elected officials that potentially might be corrupt, which there are a lot of corrupt officials. I got corrupt officials right here in my police department. Yeah. I know them. Absolutely. I'm not going to say their names, but I know they're corrupt because I know their backgrounds and they probably laugh. If they're listening because they forget what I do for a living. But um, there's there's a lot of people in the government here in the in the state of Arizona that are corrupt. So when you're speaking against those people, that's going to happen. We've had corrupt politicians since the since 1775, man. Um, but we're getting weaker as a nation, and I think we need to get stronger because this is an interesting question here from Shoot Nikki Shoot. Um, my question to you as a guest and your guest is as somebody from a third world country. I see the biggest cause of, of these issues in your country, like the mass shooting events, is the lack of discipline on children. I see American children as emotionally soft and unable to handle adversity. Do you think that America blames guns for mass shootings because they don't want to admit that they have raised Americans in, a, in broken homes and with a lack of fortitude to handle the adversity? I don't know. What do you think about that one? That's on. Say yes up there. Yeah. There's a lot of yeah in that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot because I, I, you know, I've lived and worked in over 47 different countries and I'll tell you what, yes, we're one of the weaker countries in the face of the planet, you know, for cult- culturally country. speaking, well, not necessarily countries laughing at us right now. They are. And it's like, well, yeah, well you guys don't have freedom. Okay. Screw you. Guess what? We're not going to have freedom if we keep going this way. If right. we keep seeing, if we keep seeing posts like this and from other, the rest of the world saying, Hey, you guys are soft. You know that, right? Yeah, exactly. That's why we're being taken advantage of right now by the Chinese and everybody else, because we are, have, we have become soft. Um, so I would say, again, it starts with the, your kids. You know, if you have kids, you know, educate them. Um, you know, like we were talking to our kids the other night about what to do in the event of an active shooter situation because you told my kids your, your story, and it was like, wow. They were they were like, wow, this is a perspective I've never heard. So try to share that with these these kids, and, and hopefully that, you know, when something does happen, they can be a little bit more prepared. They can be a little more situationally aware. Yeah. And I think that's something that we're, you know, if you see all the, the comments and questions on social media issues and kids having their heads sucked into the phone nowadays. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, because it's a huge problem. Not to say that we can't get good things off of our devices and, and learning and, and knowledge. And, but when you're sucked into that thing for eight hours a day and you can't even get up off the couch and walk to the kitchen without staring at your phone, missing yeah. a moment, that's a, that's a serious issue. So if you see your kids doing that, you're a part of the problem. Okay. Yeah. So be a part of the solution and help your children. Um, and so that's, that's a reality. That is the way other countries think of America, right? And, and I think it's pretty spot on. And I've been in certain places, like I've been in West Africa, East Africa, and I've talked to children. And if you ask them, hey, what do you know about America? They will tell you more about America's history than we will. And it's a very embarrassing thing. Yeah. So, yeah, there's, if, you're, if you think that, you know, you have uh, a lack of fortitude to handle adversity with your parenting styles or your children – then do it, but do it with love, right. you know, and do it. With, the biggest problem I see is like, we talk about compassion and vulnerability. Pe- parents are scared to be vulnerable with their kids, right? They are they're, scared, they're to, scared to be vulnerable with anybody. Some people have a fear of that. And I, I know that 
that played true for me for a long time. Yeah. Well, if you if you are not vulnerable with your children, I'll tell you this: um, you will create a big question in their mind about you. Um, I my, my I'm gonna call my mom out here, man. You know, my mom is, um, you know, bless her heart. She's she can't share. Yeah. It's hard for her to share. It's it's just that era, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, my dad will share a little bit more, but he's more quiet. Um, and that stemmed down to my brother. My brother doesn't share very well either. He's getting, he's getting better at it, but he's, he's, you know, with his older age now, but, uh, I can never get anything out of them. I yeah. would always come home and say, Hey man, can I talk about some of the issues I have? Nah, we don't talk about that stuff. Yeah. Well, Hey mom, can I talk to you about finances and how do I, how do I set up my accounts and stuff? And don't ever get a credit card. Never take a loan. That's all I'm going to tell you. Okay. What else? What, what kind of failures have you had in your life? Right. None. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what that does is it makes me want to live a perfect life. Yeah. And I strive for perfection. And guess what happens when you don't see yourself as perfect all of a sudden? You let yourself down all the time. You are ashamed yeah. because you're not perfect. So instead of striving for perfection, teach your children to strive for excellence. Come right? on. Right? I like that. So when you when you, when you you strive for that excellence and you fail, you're like, all right, let's do it again. Yeah. Because that's I'm on this path of excellence to wow. climb the ladder, man. And, and don't be afraid to fail. You know, my biggest fear, I think, for a long time, especially, you know, becoming a professional, right, in what I do – was a fear of failure and 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 i didn't go out for certain teams or you know like let's say swat or whatever motors you know stuff like that because i was afraid to fail i knew like what it, what it would take and i didn't want to embarrass myself in front of you know my partners for a long time you know and i had to get over that i had to say no knock it off because then you're gonna miss out you only have one time to do this career what are you doing you know and i've i've i mean i came out of my shell you know and but it was something i had in me since I was, I think, young, you know, it's just, I think people get too afraid because they have like an image to uphold and they don't want to let people down or, you know, be yeah. embarrassed or whatever. And I tell my kids, man, don't be afraid to fail. My ego starts on, on, you know, no pun intended, but on the playground when you're, yeah. when you're growing up trying to learn people. Absolutely. And, and, oh, he plays tetherball better than me. And now you're judged and now you're not being perfect. And then next thing you know, your parents are yelling at you and telling you, you should be a certain way. Right. Don't do this. Don't do that. Um, you know, I, I think that's where I love when Jordan Peterson says, um, you know, let your children do dangerous things carefully. I love that. I was fortunate enough. My dad and my mom were great at that. Um, uh, they were great at letting me do dangerous things carefully. And yeah. it was, and let me say, if, if JP's <laughs> listening to this, I want to meet you. <laughs> and so I got a lot of respect for you, my man. He's an incredible so, man. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, you might see him on the show yeah. one day. So we'll see. Um, but I think back to this whole thing, man, is like it's it's you can't there's certain times that we can absolutely without a doubt blame, you know, when something went wrong. And, you know, but I think the the problem that I have is and I hate to start a sentence with the problem with that is and I don't, I don't like that. But I don't know any other way to say that when something bad happens, which is a foreseen, right, unsurmountable, terrible, horrible thing like this book, Kelly Wilson, things might go terribly, horribly wrong. Yes, that's a fact. So when they do, if you're not directly involved, if you're not hurting, you better be serving, Yeah. right? And that's the problem I see is that instead of serving other people, if you look at the internet after that shooting, it was nothing but blame this and burn that and I'm going to kill these people anger. and anger and disappointment and frustration and fear and uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, be honest, I, th- I think guys, uh, you know, I've been through a lot of adversity in my life. And one thing that I have realized, if you don't remember anything else is I think we need to stop yeah. that. We need to get off that racket because that's exactly what that racket is. And the more you do that in your life, like a basic racket is like, man, I can't pay my bills. I just can't get a break. I can't fuck man. Fuck. And, and it's like, stop. You're creating a racket, right? And what a racket is, is something in your life that per- still persists, but yet you still resist. Okay. You have to crush it. You have to get over it. Sometimes the best way to do that is to stop, look around, listen, right? Cause you know, like Liam said on the last podcast, listening costs nothing, but talking just might. So for those people that are out there that go into more of a, an aggressive judgmental state of what that, what the problem is down in Texas or in, in stock, you know, anywhere, anywhere there's a bad situation in the world, you need to stop and listen. And you need to realize, man, there's some serious hurt going on right now. There's mothers and fathers that just, that are sitting there saying, I didn't get to say goodbye. Right. You know? And so, you know what the first thing you should do if you got kids or you got family or you got friends or employees or anybody else? 
Maybe you should think about how you say goodbye every day. Maybe you start with that, right? Maybe that should be more meaningful. Maybe you should have more significance in that because if you don't, then something happens and you never see that person again. You probably know what that feels like. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, I know what that feels like. And uh, so I've tried to really be better at saying goodbye. Yeah. Um, so if you're a parent out there and you're dropping your kid off of school today or tomorrow morning, say goodbye, right? Um, in a loving, compassionate way. And so that, that comes with, you know, and you can see there's a lot of pain there with that because I've not done that with my kids the best that I could, especially in the past. Man, I was in the military. I wasn't there for them, you know? I was out saving the world. And next thing you know, I realized, man, I'm not giving my kids the best life that they, they really should have because that's really what it's all about is our future. Um, you know, if you go off the old Thomas Paine quote, if there's going to be trouble, let it be now. Let it be in my time. So, therefore, my children will be safe in the future. I live by that, man. Yeah. But I wonder what he meant by that now. And I wonder if my dad said that. If there's going to be trouble, let it be now in my time in Korea. And then I wonder if my grandfather said that. If there's going to be trouble, let it be now in my time so my children may be safe. So my dad will be safe. Right. And then he goes to World War II. And then, then his grand, his father, did, did he say that in World War One? His, his right. grandfather, did he say that in the Civil War and the American Revolution War, which I can date back to in my family? And I'm wondering, wait, wait there's always going to be trouble. There has been for at least the last eight generations of my family. So I get what he's saying now. Yeah. There's always going to be trouble. And if it's, it's in your time, what are you doing to make the world a better place than what you came in it? And I think and that's- are you, are you reacting or are you responding to adversity and troubles, right? I think that's a big difference, you know, like that you talk about pausing a little bit, like that pregnant pause going, all right, am I going to react to this? Or am I going to respond to this? And that's something, again, that's something that I learned over the years, you know, and, and the same thing with my kids, you know, we have a rule in our house to not go to bed on your anger. Do we break it sometimes? Yeah. That's smart. Right. Because I don't know that, I mean, I, I learned at six and a half years old, how fragile life really is and can be taken from you at a moment's notice. Serving as a, as a police officer for 18 and a half years now, I've seen a lot of tragic things happen to people that thought they, they had more time, right? I've lost friends and loved ones. Even recently, I thought I had more time, right? And, and, and life is very, very fragile. And so, yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, I, I tell everybody that I, that I love, friends, brothers, you know, family, I love you. I, I think, you know, some people are, some people won't even say that to people that they love. That's they because they, th they think it's soft. They think it's weak. Yeah, I mean, but that's, the, no, I, I, it's not weak. It's real. It's raw. It's, it's, it's how you feel. Because it's real love. If you right. love somebody, you tell them that. Yeah. Yeah. I tell, I tell, you know, Jim Fuller over there, as crazy <laughs> as he is, man, you know, I hug him all the time. I love you, brother. I do you too. Know? Yeah. I love that guy, you know, and, and I, I appreciate him, you know, and. And Jim's the reason why Rob's here. So thanks, Jim and Darren <laughs> out there. I appreciate <laughs> you, man. You know, and, and he's a good, good person to have in your corner. Um, well, I don't I, want to get off topic. Man, no, so, I think it's important, know. man. It's important because, you know, again, I, I think we talked about this last night. The definition of weakness is not being able to withstand an attack, but the definition of vulnerability is the ability to open yourself up for one. Yeah. To be open yourself up for criti for being criticized, for being wrong, you know, and or realizing, man, I shouldn't have said that in that argument. I That's where it went wrong, you know, and sit your ass on a bed and go, okay, what did I do wrong? And then how do I fix this? And then how do I, you know, not perpetrate again and how do I not withhold this and get rid of it um, by sometimes telling somebody you love them that's a way to do it yeah you know and say hey man I'm sorry love yeah. you brother you know exactly and, and then if you don't do that and you withhold it which is a big problem in the world and something happens to that person month down the road a year down the road and you withheld that pain and what that thing that Didn't you I? did man you will that's hard to that's hard to let go of you know, so again, I think that message is for a lot of the parents out there that, that you know, you keep asking us, again, like we're not some moral authority here that's going to tell people how to live their lives better. But from your perspective as being a victim and, and being in, in, in law enforcement and being in shootings and, and, and um, being what, what I consider you as, uh, which I think you'll hear more the voice of reason, because that's what you really are, man. I mean, is your podcast coming. You're, you're, you're <laughs> compassionate. You care about people. Um, and that's the biggest attribute to, to being a warrior. And that's, that's who I want to be with when, when shit goes down. Um, so Robert and, and kind of, you know, everything we've talked about thus far, let's, let's go through like a, um, 
like a list of things that, you know, I know people are asking, what do we do? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, how do we fix this? Well, first off again, I think it starts at the community level. Like we talked about yeah. neighborhoods, getting to know your neighbors, um, getting to know your, who you're, I mean, I bet half the people in the city, maybe probably 90%, hell, not even half probably don't even know who their city council or elected right. officials even are. Um, you know, I know we, I have people that I drive by with every day that live here and go, who are these people on all these electro- election signs all over the place? Like, well, you should probably know that because they're about to be your leaders. Right. You know? And if you don't know that and you're not taking pride in that, you're part of the problem. I'm sorry. This is America. The last I checked. And we have an election process, right? Well, the elections are rigged anyway, so it's not worth it. Okay, well, what are you going to do? Just sit there and do nothing then? I, I, I would love to, to, you know, find a better way to, to do that right now. But we have to trust that process because we don't have any other process. Right. So make sure the people that are being voted for are in. Yeah. And uh, so I think that's a, that's a big deal. And that doesn't start at the presidential level, right? The president doesn't mean shit for state laws. Uh, it, it doesn't mean anything that's going to affect us directly right now. That's your city council. That's your, your mayor, your governor, your sheriff, who's an elective official. Um, you know, and there's a lot of corrupt sheriffs out there. I'm sorry, there are. And so find the good ones. And I think as far as the, as far as the, uh, you know, my opinion now, you know, cause everybody asked me, I'm sure they want to hear it too is how do you fix this, the security issue? Well, if I was to look at my home, okay, you cannot break in my home. Why? Because I made it that way. Right. Right. Now it's not some armored fortress. It doesn't have vault walls and, 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 you know, inch and a half thick bulletproof glass. It doesn't have any of that stuff. You have to remember that most professional criminals are going to look for soft targets. Yep. Okay. And you said it best. What is a school? It's a soft target. It is still a soft target. Just even if you hardened the school, it's still a soft target to the criminal mind, to, to the to the person that's going to go in there and try to create chaos and disruption, right, and kill people. Um. So then we we have to, you know, even though it's soft men, mentality wise, physically we need to make it hard. Um. So and and if you look at your home, where you would have gates, fences, you know, um. Dogs that bark, alarm systems, motion sensors, glass break sensors, um, you know, change out all the strike plates on your damn, on your doors and put in one inch, you know, hardened case screws instead of the little crappy three quarter inch ones that come with your house so that I can't kick your door open. Uh, go to Uline.com and get, get freaking uh, the 3M laminate you put on your windows. Mm-hmm. You can squeegee it all of yourself with a bottle of soapy water and squeegee it all like a sticker. Yep. You can't break. It takes me about a minute and 40. I've tried minute 40 seconds to, to as an advanced mechanical and thermal and ballistic breacher. I, it takes me a minute 40 seconds to, to get through that with tools um, to where I can get inside to open the door. No professional criminal is going to sit there for a minute no. and 40 seconds, as you know, being a law enforcement officer on your house when they can go to the neighbor's house and right. break right in. Um, I don't have creatures of opportunity. Yeah. I don't have garage door emergency handles hanging down. They're zip tied up. I don't have, I lock my internal garage door every night. You know, I, I make sure all sliding glass doors are pinned and barred and I have the 3M laminate on. So you can't throw a chair through it or a rock through it. Um, if I do that for my home, because I don't even need to use a gun. Right. Right. Do I have guns in my house? Of course I do. Right. But that's a last line of defense. So let's look at that just like an executive protection mission or a PSD mission. Or I think everybody out there, you know, if you don't know what those terms are, look at the secret service when they protect the president, you don't have to worry about the people that are directly around the president. They're not going to shoot at you. Okay. It's the other 150 people that are within the local vicinity, not including the other 1600 people that are Capitol police, not including the helicopters, the ISR overwatch and everything else that the secret service does. That's going to kill you before you can get there. So your concentric rings of security are what alert you to something happening. Right. We need to be better at that in schools, All right? So there's a big, big deal there. And I know that's hard. That's hard for me to, I wish I could walk into my school and say, guys, give me one month, please. And I will secure this place and you won't even know it, which right. is the whole point of an executive protection detail or protective detail in general is to be there, but you're not in, you're not in, you're not um, inconveniencing the principal. You're not, you're not changing their daily life. You're just making sure that nothing happens to them. Yeah. I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, I think it's a training aspect too. Um, you know, I've worked in and out of school districts and, and different schools for 20 years now, and uh, even before law enforcement. Um, I, I was able to write an article recently, it was just a short little tidbit in Campus Safety Magazine, and they published it. And uh, I talked about whose responsibility is it? And, and I talked about taking ownership. And I talked about, I don't care if you're a teacher or a counselor or a janitor. 
you have an obligation to keep our students and the rest of your staff members on that campus safe. So if you see something that needs to get fixed, fix it. Make sure it gets done. If you see a, a hole in the fence, right, so to Say speak, something. physically or, you know, metaphorically, let's get it fixed. Let's work together and do it because, you know, ultimately it's, it's down to everybody. I don't care if you're a counselor, a teacher, administrator, you know, if you're on well, that campus, well, what do you, you think about the teacher? Ownership. I get that. But what, what do you think about the teacher that says, uh, well, I'm a teacher. My job is not to, to carry a gun and protect people. I'm, my job is to teach people. What, okay. What's your, then, I, then I'll ask that same teacher. Then what's your plan? You may not carry a gun. I'm not, I'm not saying you have to carry a gun. Okay. I think that's, that, that's a, a good idea for some, right? Not all. I don't want all, every teacher carrying a gun. I don't either. No. I don't either. Some people don't have the mindset, you know, or the fortitude to, to do what they need to do. Um, but what, uh, what, are, what are you bringing to the table then? What are you going to do if it happens? Or right. the anti-gun, because I know you dealt with that when you're when after the after the massacre in your city, um, there was teachers that started organizations, attached themselves to. I remember reading about this too, the Brady Bill stuff, yeah. and they were anti-gun. Cleveland School remembers remembers that's the organization. Yeah. So what what happens if you have a teacher that's like completely anti-gun? They want to no no guns in school. What do you ask that person? Again, what are you going to do? And I've asked these these, these ladies, right? And I'm very close to this group. Right? We don't we don't believe politically. We're not on the same end of the spectrum, I guess. You know, because because of my stance on on the Second Amendment, um, they're going after the tool and not the root cause. However, I protect them in what they do. And I've been I've had reporters try to try to hit me up, you know, and and, and try to turn me on them. Yeah. Right, and I knew exactly what they were doing, and I protected them, and they and they protect me as well. Good for you, right? Because we have ultimately we have the same goal in mind. We don't ever want to see another student or somebody innocent get hurt, not only in our mm. schools but in the community, right? So I'm going to protect that, and I'm going to support them in what they do, right? So it, it's well, that's a great. I mean, I love that point there, man, because. There are a lot of people in this country, in the world, that don't see eye to eye on the same thing and become just arch enemies of each other. Versus it you, have to be that you way. are you are still communicating and, and compassionately caring about these people because number one, they're Americans. Yeah. Number one, they can do whatever the hell they want. Absolutely. In this country, right? That's what makes this country great. Um, so just because they have a different point of view, doesn't mean you're not going to support them. Doesn't? Would you lay your lives down for those ladies? Absolutely. Just because they have a different opinion for you, absolutely, you still would. Yeah. You I know? mean, I like. There's a lot of people that will say otherwise in that, and I think that you need to be very careful with that mentality. It's yeah. very dangerous. It's a liability to say, well, screw the, the liberals or screw the anti-gun people because they're a part of the problem and they should be killed. Or I'll, I'll be the you know, first to not protect them. You're not a real American then. You are not a real American, especially if you're a law enforcement officer or a service member that's fought for this country, put fat, foot to ask for it in order to give people the right to do whatever the hell they want. Mm -hmm. Now, are some things that people are doing – because they're doing whatever the hell they want are, are right. No, I mean, I'm not a guy that's going to go out and do a, I'm not going to change my gender, man. I don't, right. I'm sorry. I'm just, that's not what I subscribe to. Am I going to judge somebody that does? No, I can't. I'd be a fucking hypocrite if I judge somebody for wanting to be uh, Catholic versus Christian or Muslim versus uh, Buddhist or Republican versus Democrat or male versus female or transgender. Yeah. Yeah. Some things I don't agree with fundamentally. I don't think, um, you know, those things are good for your physiology, right? <laughs> um, but people do it yeah. and I will still lay down my life for them. Absolutely. If I have to. Absolutely. And if people don't agree with that, then the, that's my opinion, not yours. And, and they're the and, ones with and, the problem. And your opinion is none of my business. So right. I love that, man, that you're able to be, you know, compassionate towards people uh, that don't believe the same thing as you. And I believe that is one of the biggest problems in our country. And I've mentioned it before is common enemy intimacy. Yeah. Right. Because you could very easily be like, hey, those people over there, they're bad. Let's talk right. shit about them, right? To me, right? And let's say you and I didn't know each other, and you see this group that's like, hey, these people are bad. Let me tell you why. And I'm like, oh, really? They're bad? Well, shit, I'll throw rocks at them too, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, you, you just create a common enemy intimacy, right? We have this common enemy now, but you and I have nothing in common, right? That's the problem with Antifa or Black Lives Matter movements and other things like that. There's a lot of good in some of those organizations, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of bad in them as well. And, and the bad is not understood because it's based on common enemy intimacy. I mean, Brene Brown talks about this a lot, and I, I think she's she's spot on with it. 
And uh, and I think we need to be very careful before we start judging people. Absolutely. You know? Even the even the incident commander down there didn't didn't oh he didn't bring his radio. What? I could easily be very careful in there not to judge him, but I, it's hard for me not to. But I don't have all the facts either. So at a certain no, point, I, I stop, I listen, and I go, "Wait a minute, maybe something else went down where he couldn't have one." Right. Right. Um, but again, I'm not going to make excuses for people being negligent on stuff. And of course, once the information comes out, uh, we could take it for for what it's worth. But um, I, I also think that there's a potential solution here that's going to have to happen because. I think we'd all be foolish to think that an active shooter scenario will never happen again. We know it's going to happen again. Absolutely. It happens every day in certain cities. Like I was talking about Chicago earlier or heinous crimes. Like this incident that just happened this year with this girl getting stabbed 27 times. Yeah. That that's why are nobody talking about that? Right. Right. So those things happen every day that we don't talk about. But as soon as a dude with an AR-15 or an AK-47 or some rifle, semi-automatic weapon system goes into a school or a church or a recruiting office or a military base right. and starts shooting it up, it makes national news. Right. I would love to hear about this this girl more. I want to hear about her family. I want to see you know what we could do to help them. Um, yeah. I, I, what about them? Right. So they're not getting any attention right now, but everybody in Texas is for good reason, right? But there's no reason that they shouldn't get the same amount of attention and support and love. And I know you're doing that. Um, and so I think that this is going to turn into where there's going to have to be some type of flight deck program like like pilots have. Well, why do, why do pilots all of a sudden have the ability to carry a gun and go through a pretty extensive, very well program, right. a well-oiled program of instruction for I think it's two weeks, right, for the, for the Marshall's flight deck program? And they shoot, they shoot great. Every right. flight deck officer that I've ever had that comes to my classes, I'm impressed. I'm mean, good. You guys are doing a good job over there. Um, but they will probably never have to use that gun because they created concentric rigs of security inside the aircraft where you can't even get to them. Right. Worst case scenario, you get to the nucleus. Okay, he's got a gun now. Great. So that happened after 9-11. Okay, well, all right, a terrorist attack justified that. And sometimes it takes that to happen. I think we're I think we're beyond justification of a program. Yeah. And and again, we can't take and all of a sudden make it go from twenty nine percent of SROs in a, in the schools to a hundred percent. You know from law enforcement and just manpower issues and mass exodus right now from law enforcement, that's not gonna happen. Um so Maybe what should happen is some type of program where a new organization stands up, a new agency stands up. And that, it doesn't have to replace police officers. No, not one bit. Right. It's, no. It'd be a different job. It has to be a, it has to be a very well-oiled machine that, that collaborates extremely well with law enforcement. Right. You know, or we start recruiting specifically for that job. Yeah. And, and if you are an SRO, it's only a 40-hour program. Big deal. I go to an SRO program for, in a week. All right. I could probably learn all that stuff on YouTube. But what do I need to be doing as part of that program as well? We need to have people that are critical thinkers. Right. Um, so that's why I started going through this in my head going, well, maybe what if we had SROs? And, and this is conscious thoughts here. We max out 100%. We get them there, right? That's the hardest part. Well, that's never going to happen. So that's why it has to be another organization or contracted organization. That's why we went to PMCs overseas because the military did not have the time or bandwidth to do all those jobs all of a sudden. Right. And so maybe there's something, I'm not saying Blackwater's going to be in your school, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, but what if these guys, uh, in order to be an SRO, you have to, and which is mandatory, every police officer has to go through that program. Sorry. Well, that's just a lot of shit that we don't need to know. Well, I, I didn't I do combat diving yeah. operations, you know, 99% of the time in my career as well. But when I had to do it, that 1%, I knew how to do it very, very well. I was a master at it. Um, so why can't a cop take on a simple 40-hour program and learn these things about being a good good police officer inside of a school and doing that community policing yeah. and helping kids and, and motivating them and recruitment and helping them understand what it's like to contribute to society? And then you swap out every month. Every officer has to know every school in that department, right? And I'm sure a lot of cops are going, and trust me, I'm being law enforcement. I know that's like, dude, you're coming come on, you're coming off crazy, man. Yeah. Exactly. But it's necessary. And also that officer needs to go and pass all SWAT certification schools by a credit accredited or a uh, extremely highly vetted organization that can make sure that they they pass like four hundred round qualification course of fires. I mean that's what our simple one is. Our D five students in a three day class do a four hundred round aggregate course of fire to qualify to see where their baseline is right 
Then we start working on performance caps for the rest of the three days. We had to take some of those shots yesterday in the simulator. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a hard shot. I <laughs> it mean, is. It's, it's very so, difficult. And, and when you're confronted with that worst case scenario, you're going to wish to God or whoever sourced energy, whoever you pray to, that you can be that person that can make that shot in that yeah. situation. And, uh, and I'll tell you from, from, you know, training and understanding and talking to people that have been in those situations that failed, it's the worst scenario you could ever live with yeah. the rest of your life. So why don't people take that seriously? You know, um, and I think that at that point they need to qualify once a month with both judgmental use of force simulations type training or simunitions type training. That's again, highly vetted. And then they, um, need to train with the SWAT teams every time SWAT goes out and trains. Why? So you can be a critical thinker. So you can get those skills. Well, that's a lot of stuff on top of our daily job. Well, welcome to Special Operations U.S. Military. Exactly. So maybe that's what we need. If there's only 800,000 police officers in the country, instead of being basic patrol guys in SWAT, maybe they should be Special Operations. Maybe they should have a higher critical thinking. They should go through belief system training. They need to understand what compassion and vulnerability means, public speaking, understanding how to de-escalate situations with their intellect and their voice, not with a gun or mace or a baton or or, or axon, okay? Right. Um, so those things are like wishful thinking is the problem. So maybe there's an organization out there that can do it. And I know there is because we've done it before. And um, so that's my personal theory because I, I know law enforcement couldn't do that. That's why I say, okay, well, there's a great idea in my mind because the world's made up of good ideas and bad ideas. I think a good idea would be create that organization. Like a school marshal. And test it. You know, like Florida's trying to do it with the Guardian yeah. program. Um, I, I have questions about that program from what I've witnessed, but I'm not going to judge it because they're doing the right thing. Because if you got a dude standing outside of a, a school with an M4 and people know that, what happens? Right. There's a show of force that you're probably going to go pick a softer target. And then that's the other problem is now another school gets hit because they're a softer target. Well, that school needs to step up and then so on and so but on. Good and so for on. Florida for, for at least taking a step. Absolutely. You know, and I mean, we'll, we'll see. And, and I wish them all the best, you know, but they need to train. But when will it get tested? Right. When it happens. Yeah. So when something happens in Florida, you better hope to God your programs are solid yep. and a hundred thousand percent. Because when an active shooter tests that hypothesis, which is all it is right now, is a theory of the Guardian program, and breaks that, guess what will happen? See? This was all a bad idea. We should have never armed teachers, especially giving them M4s, man. <laughs> you shouldn't have done that. So I hope that doesn't happen, and I wish them well. And, um, and I think we should be thinking about this even deeper than even those programs. Yeah. So, again, great job for those organizations and agencies out there you know, doing that and, and committing the time and money to it. Um, but they can never commit enough. Right. You know, that's if you ask guys in top tier units, they're like, it's never enough. We can't train enough. We can't jump enough, dive enough, shoot enough, do surveillance enough, hostage rescue enough. We can't communicate enough. There's guys going to like Harvard and stuff now in special operations just to get public speaking type gigs and things. So they can actually be better communicators in their job. Right. Um, you know, and, and so like, why are, why are, if you're a law enforcement officer out there, take pride in that. Yeah, You know, take pride in, in how hard this job actually is, especially if you're a new officer, which we're seeing a big influx of new officers coming in because of the max exodus and yeah. the recruiting that's happening. Guys, if you're a young officer, you're, you're, there's a high potential you're going to be groomed. And I'm not saying be disruptive. Don't be like me, <laughs> you know, but think outside the box, man. Be, yeah. a, be a thinker. Be a thinker. And, and you know, I, I always tell people, regardless of if my career were to end tomorrow for whatever reason, I will always... I will always back law enforcement as a whole because police officers have to make split second life and death decisions across our country every day that take a courtroom full of experts. Yeah. If you ask police officers, right or wrong, you ask the cops, you know? they love and hate every second of their job. Yeah. But they, these decisions are split second and sometimes they're life and death decisions, you know, and they have to act because, you know, if they fail to act, you know, they, they take one more second than they should could cost somebody's life, you know? Yeah. So, well, I think that's the thing. If you're a law enforcement officer out there and you might be asking, well, what the hell do I do personally? If I show up and I have a policy and I have a TDP, TTP to, to, to go into this school, how should I do it? My only answer to you is in that situation, it's not a barricaded suspect. It's not a domestic violence situation. It's not a, tr a traditional felony stop. It's, it is, you know, 
It's an active shooter. It's not a murderer you're chasing through the streets. It's not a bank right. robber. It's an active shooter. It is an active shooter. So your entire and only objective at that point in time, I don't give a shit what your policies are. I'm sorry. This is a human. This is yeah, a mother. Yeah. Na- this is a mother nature narrative, not a human narrative. Your entire job is to stop that threat. Yeah. Right. Well, how do you do it? By changing their objective. So if I have a shooting going on and I respond, I'm right around the corner. I show up a minute later. My entire job is to get to that person and change their objective. Well, by seeing me now and potentially being received, you know, receiving gunfire from me or communications or yelling or screaming, I am changing the objective from them killing a child. Absolutely. Right. And then let's say they turn on me and they shoot at me and I miss and they hit me and I die or I get wounded and I'm out of the fight. Hopefully the next officer is doing the exact same objective is trying to change the bad guy's objective. But damn it, there's another person now. Damn it, there's another person. And they're right. dead. So w- what we're doing is simply changing the objective of the shooter off of the, your, their original objective, their target, their children As of the school be. or whoever, the, the store, like in, in New York, in Buffalo, if you've seen that video. Um, yes. And stop laying down. Don't lay down and put your face in the ground. Right. You don't hear anything else. That's what they want you to do. If you watch the Buffalo shooting video, which it's out there, it's very hard when you watch them go and walk over the top of people and dead check them in the back of the head. Um, why? Because they're not looking. They're putting their head down when they hear gunfire, and they're scared to death, and they don't do anything else. You have just become a victim much more quicker than the person that's running and trying to get away or fighting, which fighting's hard, man. You know, it is. Fighting's hard. If somebody knows what they're doing with a rifle and they're outside of a door and you're on the inside of the door and they know you're there... That's, that's not that, easy to that's get That's why it's with. important to train. And, and you know, if you're employers, if you're employed by a school district or something, even even you work in a hospital or any campus-based organization, you have to train. And if that just means getting you and two other buddies at work together and going, all right, let's run a scenario real quick, then do it. Yeah. Right? Because you're going to – everybody reverts to, to their lowest level of training when, when an incident happens, right? So, you know, I don't want my lowest level of training to be low, you know? I want it to be above average and, 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 and as high as it can be so I can respond accordingly and, and, and hopefully get out of that, that scenario alive, you know? Yeah. And so it, it may take you taking ownership and saying, all right, we're, we're going to train. We're going to do this, you know? And it may sound silly, but it's, it's necessary. You have to do this. It's absolutely necessary. And, I, I, you know, something just popped in my head here from a quote that we share in classes uh, quite often. There's a book called Peak um, by Robert Sarah. Er- Robert Anderson and Eric Poole. And these guys are the, the plank owners, the founders of deliberate and purposeful practice, right? So they talk about the sports performance behind getting something down. Like you're saying, you've got to train, you got to train, you got to train. Well, they have a great quote. And I'll try to, I'll try not to paraphrase it too much here, but um, it's goes something like, you know, the, you know, people don't, ex, don't possess extraordinary physical or mental capabilities not because they don't have the capacity for them, but rather they're comfortable to live in the rut of homeostasis and never do the work that's required to get out of it. And they simply live in a world that is good enough. I think a lot of us could look at that and say, well, you know, hey, this morning when I got out of bed, did I make my bed? Eh, I did it good enough, right? That's where you just fucked up because you just failed to accomplish the first thing of your life. Now I'm not saying you got to make your bed. I know Adam McRaven has this big speech. I've been teaching my kids to do that in, in a lot because it's a great opportunity to make your bed and start the day fresh and make an accomplishment. Because when you come home to a made bed after a shitty day, you get to start all over. It's a good reminder. I stayed in your guest room. I made your bed, by the way. Thank you. Good. <laughs> <laughs> or Tony's going to strip it anyways. <laughs> um, so with that, it's... Can you go into, let's say, let's say you go back to work tomorrow, which I know you will, and you'll be back on the job, on the streets, you know, police in our communities, and you get that call, Rob. Are you going to go into it with a good enough mentality? Yeah. How do you change that to where you don't, you're not satisfied to live in the comfortable, comfortable rut of homeostasis? I always strive to, to be better. To train, just like right, you said. To train, right? you know, and, and not get complacent, you know. And I, I shared with you yesterday, you know, we're doing some training upstairs. And I said, you know, I allowed myself to get complacent in my job for a long time because of, you know, home life and, you know, things got hard, right? You know, went through a six and a half year divorce and, you know, some things from the outside just, it was it was heavy, right? But I had to snap out of that the last few years and go, all right, no, I need to train, yeah, you know, and I can't make excuses anymore. and I And I don't train enough, 
right? I always need more, <laughs> you know, yeah. and I and I strive for it, and I I, I long for it, you know. I, I'm always trying to train, and and training doesn't always have to be dynamic, right? It could be visual. Yeah, I mean, even just driving down the street, I always play what ifs in my mind. I pull up to the red light, and this car pulls up next to me. What if? What if three guys jump out? What am I gonna do? I'm pumping gas, you know. Somebody comes up to to rob me. What do I have in my hand? I got a gas pump, you know, <laughs> douse them with gasoline, you know. Yeah. I mean, do something, right? What What am I gonna do, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and I don't and think it's always necessary. It has to be something bad. You could be have that car pull up next to you, and they're on their phone, and you see a woman crossing the street with the baby stroller. Absolutely. And then that car starts to take off. I'm gonna crash into that car. Situational awareness. I will take the I will take the ticket for that one because I don't want a baby getting run over. Right. You know, with somebody not being aware. So like it's all those things I think are great. And that's that's good. You know, that's that's not good, that's great, right? Because again, when we start to go, you know, you shoot, you do a scenario, like imagine if somebody went up there and was like, Yeah, I know I got electrocuted, I know I got shot, but it was a good enough run. No, it wasn't because you're dead in real life. There's children, there's people that are dead because you lived in a world that is simply good enough. And so if you carry a gun, you carry a badge, you're a responsible armed citizen, you're a military guy, you're anything out there that is contributing to society in some way, shape, or form to make it a better place than what you came at it, you better realize that you cannot go into that situation with a good enough mentality. Uh, I think Mike Jones said this the other day on one of his videos. You're going to wish you were the best, baddest special operator in the world when somebody breaks into your house at night. So yeah. are you training good enough right now? Are you ready for that? Now, the big question is people go, well, how do I, I don't have the money. I don't have the time. I can't get to a class. I can't go into range anytime I want. Like, well, yes, you can, number one, because it's a racket, like I said earlier. Number two is you don't need ammo. You don't need those things. You need, like, mental visualization training that Liam and I talked about in the last podcast. Like, people will say, I just don't have the time or money to train. Well, Liam lives in Connecticut. He's not allowed to own guns there yet. He's still transitioning to America as, as a, uh, you know, through his immigration process. So he can't have guns. But he gets better every time I see him in a class or a competition, shooting sport or something like that. And why? And I'm like, dude, what's your secret? He's like, mental visualization representation, just like you taught me. And just like we've studied all the white papers and science out there to how that really does make a difference. So you imagining that vehicle or that bad thing that's about to happen, what you're doing is a mental visual Mm -hmm. representation training. Every professional athlete and Olympian or a race car driver, any of those types of sports, especially in extreme sports, we visualize things over and over and over and over and over and over before we do it. And we test the hypothesis, you know, by going to a training class eventually when I get the time and money. So don't think that it's, it's, you're helpless, you know, but like you said, life gets you, man. Yeah. Marriage, divorce, kids, family, job, paperwork. You're like, damn, I don't have time to get to the range. Yeah. I know, but you're falling into that good enough world and, yeah. and we don't ever want to do that. So, well, dude, we've been talking for a bit, and I, I think yeah. this is going to probably happen again. Um, but in, in in closing here, you know, I know we I know we didn't give all the answers. It's not our job, like we said. But we are having a, a forum here to talk about yeah. things, and, and thank you for for giving your perspective, man, from a, from being a small child and being a victim in a school shooting all the way up to uh, what you do today, and uh, and that's that's. The biggest thing about you, man, is I see that I hear that voice of reason and I hear that compassion. And I and thank you for being vulnerable on the show. Um, anything else you wanna you wanna share before we punch out here? No, I, I think we have a lot of listeners out there that you know. Yeah, I mean, you're you're asking these questions, and good for you for at least you know thinking like that and asking like what what needs to happen. You know, I think there's a lot of good answers out there. You know, like Travis said, you know, we, we don't we don't have all. all all the absolute answers. We just don't. I don't. I don't think any. I don't think any incident has a hundred percent, you know, answer for it. Mm. Um, but get involved. You know, like like the gentleman, you know, said, you know, what do I need to be doing? Well, you need to be doing exactly what you're doing right now. You know, good for you. We need the people to get involved with the the, the school board meetings and the community meetings and. We need the people to, you know, put on block parties to get to know their community better and, and make your kids get involved. And Com- Combine those two things real quick for me. Because remember we talked about numbers, yeah. doing it in numbers? Yeah. So if you had a block party, you had your neighborhood, you had friends, you had community, right. guess what it happens when you now, that, that guy that sent that about going and talking to his board meeting, if you bring those numbers with you, right? what happens to an elected official now? Right. 
A lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. Um, and you're being efficient in your fight. I want to be elected again. So if I'm going to do that, I might want to make these people happy. Right. Do that, man. Numbers, numbers, numbers. We yeah. are stronger than this tiny ass corrupt government that we have currently running us right now. Now, there's a lot of amazing people in the government as well fighting for our rights. Remember that, but there's always going to be that other side. There always yeah. is in the world. It's a balance of opposites. It's the yin and the yang. And if without those, without the bad, we wouldn't have the good. Yeah. You know, without the good, we wouldn't have the bad. So you know, I, I get to travel across the country, you know, quite a bit, and um, been able to tell my story a lot. And my story, I, I like to tell, um, not not for any glamorization for me. It's not about Rob Young. It's not about what I'm doing. I, I think it, I think it's an important story that needs to be told. Uh, because I think it inspires thought, and that's really my goal, is you know to get my story out there to inspire thought, hopefully enact some change, you know. Because again, I, I'm doing what I feel that I need to do and what I can do to hopefully stop this from happening, you know. And if it can save a life, then then great, you know. What happened to me happened. It was horrible, you know. But it made me who I am today, and um, you know, again, man, I just want to say thank you for you know giving me this opportunity once again to to come and share. You know, and I look forward to doing it again, you know, and, and um, you know, it's, um, it's up to all of us. Well, dude, thank you. I know you're, um, I know this is not the last time we're going to see you, yeah. uh, whether it's on this show or just out there. I know you got a lot of yeah. things in the works. Um, so we'll make sure we put your information down on the post so people can follow you and, and keep track of what you're doing. And uh, I'm excited and, and um, to see what, what's coming down the pipe. And if there's anything we could ever do to help you with this mission, and, and even if it's just sharing like we are right now, man, because like you, you yeah. always hear me say, the world's a forum, and, and I hate the fact that we don't use that enough. So thank you for helping me build that bridge yeah. to people, exactly. and, and maybe you know, hopefully enlighten some people and help them with some ideas today. And I, at least I hope that we did. I know we did. Um, and I know that you will make the world a better place than what you came in, brother. So thank you for coming on. Thank you, Travis. Uh-huh.